Hello, our listeners. Today we have Vladimir Van Wilgenberg, who is a Dutch reporter and currently lives in Kurdistan regional government's Erbil city. Wilgenberg has been visiting northeastern Syria in and out several times, and he is currently with the local Kurdish news network K24. Welcome to the podcast, Vladimir. Thank you. It's great to have you because you are on uh, the situation. You you are uh, one of those reporters uh, very closely following the situation in northeastern Syria. And let me start with the first question, the Manbij attack. It looks like four American uh, soldiers died. Uh, what do you make of this attack just coming on today, uh, January 16. Well, it's not the first attack that targets uh, U.S. soldiers in Mumbich. Uh, there was also one U.S. soldier that died on uh, March 29. Uh, but this shows that the statements of the U.S. president uh, in the beginning that ISIS is defeated, that it's not true. And this shows that the initial, initial coalition plans that to train local security forces would have been much better, much better to prevent the resurgence of uh, ISIS. And it also shows that if U.S. Uh, troops would leave, that it would endanger uh, the northeast of Syria. Uh, and so far, uh, it's not 100% confirmed. They are saying that four U.S. soldiers were killed, according to a report by Reuters. But the U.S. that coalition says they confirmed there were deaths, but they don't specify the number. I understand. I've seen... A- Nicholas Harris is commenting as this is a sign from ISIS that we are not finished yet. And as Americans are leaving the region, uh, ISIS says we are coming back. Is this your understanding? Yeah, you you have to remember that uh, when uh, Obama left Iraq and we draw the U.S. troops, this was actually a fact that contributed to uh, ISIS uh, taking over all those areas in Iraq. So if the U.S. leaves uh, Syria, definitely there would be a big risk that ISIS uh, could come back again, same what happened before in Iraq uh, when the U.S. withdraw its troops. And um, yeah, we see now that ISIS is still capable because this is not even the only attack that ISIS carried out today. Uh, There was another attack also on Deir Zor uh, area today. So ISIS, they lost almost all their territory, but they're still able to carry out uh, attacks. You are in constant communication with the Syrian Kurdish, uh, both the leaders as well as uh, the residents. It's hard to know. I don't expect you to tell me what will happen exactly, but what is your sense if Turkish tanks are rolling in northeastern Syria, you know, upcoming weeks, uh, probably before the local elections in late March in Turkey. What do you think the Kurds would do? Well, it's still unclear if if Turkey would uh, roll in its tanks into Syria. Uh, But I've talked to officials several times before, and they said if Turkey would enter then that basically would be a fight. So unless there would be some form of an agreement uh, between the U.S. and the Kurds and Turkey, for instance, uh, then it would be different. But if there's like a new unilateral action by Turkey to enter Syria, then the Kurdish-led forces, they will fight back. Is it looks on Monday's tweet of President Trump uh, it, it appears that Trump gave a green light for buffer zone. And even though from his tweet on Sunday, he appeared to uh, be saying that U.S. will create buffer zone from his structure in that tweet. But on Monday, uh, it looked like uh, he's giving green light to Turkey to create that buffer zone. Regardless of you know, what he's saying, he's giving some kind of green light to buffer zone. 
uh, what do you say? I mean, is it enough for U.S. to say, okay, let's create buffer zone? What, have you ever looked at uh, of the situation of international aspect, whether the U.N. should be involved with this or a Syrian regime or Russia? Well, it's not very easy to create such a buffer zone. Actually, Trump was talking about the safe zone, which is different. Um, so if the U.S. and Turkey would decide that uh, on bilateral wise, then it would be basically still have an issue that it lacks legal, uh, a legal basis because Syria says Turkey is not invited to Syria. So basically uh, the Turkish forces are actually now in Syria with approval of Russia because there was an agreement between Russia and Turkey that Russia would not prevent Turkish military operations in Syria since August uh, 2016. So if Turkey would do such a thing, if that's really what's going to happen, which I doubt it's going to happen, but anyway, supposedly that's what's going to happen, it would really lack a, a legal ground. Uh, and that's why there are also other people uh, saying that such a safe zone or buffer zone actually needs uh, a UN Security uh, Council approval. Um, and I think that's why also uh, Erdogan wants to talk to Russia, because it knows that if it's only with the US, it cannot do... Um, cannot do its plans uh, in Syria. So I think it's going to be quite complicated, uh, but it's clear that Turkey wants to have something, uh, or let's say Erdogan wants to have something before the elections uh, are going to take place. Uh, we should remind the listeners that Turkey already intervened in Syria and twice within uh, in Jarablus and then Afrin and link these two areas without the UN Security Council uh, approval. And just yesterday, Turkish President Spokesman Ibrahim Kalan said, uh, for the first time, uh, if intervention happens in northeastern Syria, it's going to be similar to what already happened in Jarablus and Afrin. My final question, uh, we, we know that the Kurds and Damascus are talking and Russia is helping. Today, Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said it should be the Syrian uh, regime administration should be protecting Kurds. Uh, they are the only place can protect the Kurds. What is your sense of uh, Syrian Kurdish and the Damascus dialogue and Russia, uh, do you think the Syrian forces are coming to the region anytime soon? Well, until now, uh, it seems that there, there were negotiations between the Kurds and Damascus and also with Moscow. But until now, those negotiations are going very slow because Damascus fears to return, uh, wants to return to all of Syria. So they don't want to have like a self-administration in northeast of Syria. But at the same time, for the first time uh, this month, uh, Russian troops arrived in Arima, which is close to Mambic. And they started like joint uh, patrols with the SDF-linked council. Uh, so this shows that Russia is also messaging to Turkey that Turkey should not think to take these areas because uh, Russia thinks that the final solution would be to have the Syrian government take back all of Syria. And that's why, uh, because of the U.S. position now, the Kurds are talking with Moscow and Damascus to see if there is any solution that they can find to have still some form of autonomy and self-administration, while at the same time, for instance, uh, positioning Syrian uh, forces on the border of, of Syria and Turkey. But also the U.S. plays also a role in this because, you know, U.S. is more close to Turkey now. So now actually the Kurds are also fearing that the U.S. could be a sort of a limit, like a limiting or, or hurting such an uh, issue with Damascus to, to find a deal with Damascus. So the situation is quite complicated. And I think also the team of uh, James Jeffrey and also John Bolton, I don't think they were very happy with the Kurds talking to Damascus. Uh, and I think until now uh, the situation is not very clear. And I also I spoke with an official of the SDC yesterday, and he also told me that it's very difficult for them to comment on this situation because it's not very clear what the U.S. plans are until now. Vladimir, thank you so much. We are very lucky to have you uh, on this program again. You're giving us the latest and uh, most 
uh, detailed, uh, very important uh, developments on northeastern Syria, and we are hoping to have you again in near future. Uh, thanks so much. You're welcome.